This is the time of worship where we do continue to focus on our Lord. Uh, we think of all the things that are happening in our world today and, and the uh, uh, heresy that's going on in the world. Uh, even during the Olympics, we here. That's why we are here. We're here to worship the Lord God. Hey, last week I was a, a part of, a, or I had the privilege to take part in a summer sports camp. Now, it was a summer sports camp at an elementary here in San Antonio. Now, this sports, uh, this elementary is, is located in an, an extremely impoverished area of San Antonio, an extremely poor area of San Antonio. 90% of the people in this area live under the poverty line. The area is located in uh, in an area that's uh, riddled with violence, uh, gang, street gang activity, drugs, and, and everything else you can think of. Uh, in fact, I was told that there was a shooting just a couple of days ago just in the area of this elementary. As a matter of fact, this elementary is located in one of the most violent areas of San Antonio. In, in fact, it is the, it is the fourth most violent area in San Antonio. One of the counselors who, was, who also attended the sports camp at the elementary uh, was telling me that she deals, and she was kind of pointing out different little children as she was talking. She was kind of looking at them, and I could see it. But she was telling me that she deals with all types of, of, of trauma. She deals with trauma. She deals with neglect in these in these children. She deals with the trauma of the drive-by shootings that they that they may have experienced or that they can hear at night. She deals with the trauma of abuse, physical abuse, and even sexual abuse. She deals with that on a daily basis. Now, the kids who attended this camp, they just seemed like regular kids. They were out there. They were having fun. They looked like normal children at play, enjoying the activities that we were putting on uh, at camp. Uh, we would also take the time to talk to them about life skills and relational skills uh, throughout the camp. So it was more than just having fun, which they did. They also were taught how to get how to uh, how to handle different things in their life. They uh, they 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 reacted to the discussions very positively. Uh, one of the interesting things that I noticed about the children that were there, the students that were there, is uh, even though it was obvious that the that this school and the area was not just poor, impoverished, and violent, it for the children there that was the norm. That was the norm for them. They, they don't know any other way of other than what they, they, they see every day in life. And, you know, God forbid what they see on TV and, and the teachings that they get on television and, what, and what's going on there. Now, at the end of camp, after three days of camp, uh, there were three students, the, three of the kids that were there, they they, we all we, we would lead them out to meet to be picked up by their parents. Well, well, these three kids were always walking home. They would walk home in this area, and uh, they, and they're little. I mean, they're, you can imagine. I think the oldest one was eight years old, and they would walk together about a block and a half away. Um, the, on the third day, they were there seated, and so I sat down with them to talk to them. On the other two days, they would walk home, and one of the one of our peers would be would walk them home. They wouldn't want them to walk home by themselves, even though they were used to that. Well, here I sat with them, and I was just kind of kidding around with them. Well, one of the kids named Jaime, he, he, was a, he, he was just a young kid, but he was big, a big kid. And I noticed that that day when I, he was playing basketball and soccer and everything else we were playing, he had one of those big old chains on. Like, one of the, have you seen one of those big old thick chains? And he was running around with his T-shirt and his shorts on, but he had a chain on. And, and at the end, I was sitting down. I go, hey, I like your chain. And he goes, oh, he goes, oh, I got a wallet. So he reaches, he stands up, and he reaches down and goes under his shirt and grabs a chain and pulls out a wallet. And I go, yeah, that looks great. Hey, can I borrow a dollar? Can I borrow a dollar? I'm just kidding with him. 
And he laughs. He opens up the wallet. It's completely empty. I mean, nothing in it. He says that he's going to try to earn some money cutting the grass, some, you know, do that. And so I was kidding around with him a little bit. Uh, his sister jumps up and she says, hey, I'm going to use my Whataburger gift card today. We're going to go to Whataburger. I had given her a $20 gift card because we wanted more kids to show up. And so we told the kids, if you brought somebody, you would get a gift card. Well, she brought two people. So she got a $20 gift card. This young lady was beautiful. She could have been one of my granddaughters. So she was that beautiful. Now, and, and all these kids reminded me of me when I grew up. And I say that only to say that we spent a lot of time outside. We were toasted in the summer. Toasted. They were all toasted. <laughs> they were all toasted. And, and, and so they... They were they were talking and and they went on their way. Well, as they as it turns out, their grandma ends up coming and picking them up and taking them home. Uh, the camp was extremely successful. Um, the kids, the word got back to us that the kids wanted to know when we're coming back. When we're coming back, my brothers and sisters in Christ. What is their hope? You know, when we talk about hope for, for our children in this environment, we talk about hope. Are we talking about hope in having a successful life? Are we talking about an eternal hope? Are we talking about both? Are we talking about both? What if what is there with their hope? Uh, and rather we know who who is their hope. Sometimes Sometimes it is easier for us to see, for us to see how impoverished and needy someone else may be, and they are. So we're looking at a horizontal, we're looking at the horizontal place, and we look at somebody and we go, golly, they got it tough. They got it tough. But we don't look at ourselves and we don't see how impoverished we are and how needy we are. We're looking horizontal. We're not looking vertical. Because if we were to look from a vertical plane as God sees us, we would, he would see us impoverished. He would see us so needy. He would see the, the violence of this world. He would see the wickedness of this world and that we're living right in it. We're in it. Now, don't get me wrong. If we are Christian, Christ calls us to, to follow his example of loving and caring for others in need. And that's what we were doing. Love, we we're following the example of Christ, loving and caring for others in need. And by that, by that, you and I are blessed. However, for some Christians, even non-Christians, who are living in poverty or living in need, they may feel as though they have it all, they have enough, but they, from a reality standpoint, are living in hopelessness. They're not Christians, they're, they're living in hopelessness. And I said, some Christians, may think that too. And, and there's a reason for that. We're going to get into it in just a second. See, the good news, the good news that you and I know is that God, that Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection, paid it all. When God looks upon humanity and the wickedness of humanity and the, the eternal crime that we committed against him, we have been told, we have been given the assurance that Jesus Christ had, has paid it all. Now, what does it mean that Jesus has paid it all? Well, it means that Jesus Christ died on the cross completely and totally sufficiently paying the debt that we, fallen and broken sinners, owe it's like an accounting ledger. We had, we're, we, let's say we're bookkeepers and we had this big debt, insurmountable debt that we could never, ever, ever pay. 
even if we were to live for all eternity and our souls live for all eternity, even all eternity, in all eternity, we could never pay the debt that we owe for our sinfulness. But Jesus has done that. He has paid that debt. And we hear that so often that we sometimes forget what it all means and how much that cost him. It cost him his life. There are some Christians who do not understand the sufficiency of Jesus' atoning death. Some of us, some Christians and non-Christians, they don't understand the sufficiency, meaning that it was sufficient enough to pay for all of our sins, everyone who believes in him. See, that's what our passage is about today. Jesus' death is completely sufficient for the salvation of everyone who believes in him. Nothing else is needed. It is finished. It is finished. Jesus, Jesus himself tells us so. So the critical issue of our text is the redemption that Jesus made by making atonement for our sins. He's atoning for our sins. Big question. The big question in our text is, what is finished? Well, what is finished? What was Jesus talking about? Jesus finished what he came to do on earth. You know the story. You know who Jesus is. You know that he is the Son of God. He is God himself, who incarnate, who came down from heaven, became a human being, lived a perfect life. Then he laid his life down for us. He gave up his life for us to pay the price for us. Jesus finished what he came to do, and that was to save us. He came to save us. He tells us so in verse 30, and that's going to be the focus of our attention. Scripture reveals the truth of what Jesus is saying in verse 30. It is finished. The corrupt lies of what Jesus means when he says it is finished is even being circulated by religious denominations. Religious denominations have corrupted verse 30. Sinful men have changed the meaning of verse 30, what verse 30 and what Jesus is saying when he says it is finished. Now we start with the truth of what Jesus means when he says it is finished. This is the truth of what he means when he says that. And we know it's the truth because it's in Holy Scripture. It is in the Word of God. As we look at our text, we do focus on verse 30. The phrase, it is finished, spoken by Jesus, is one of the last words that Jesus spoke before he, would, before he was killed, before he died on the cross. The Greek word translated as if the Greek word translated to the English phrase, it is finished, it's just one word. To tell us, to tell us, to tell just one word. That one word translated to the Greek means it is finished. It is an accounting term. It is used by accountants and it means paid in full, paid in full. In this context, the context that is being used, Jesus is declaring that the debt of sin owed by humanity has been completely and permanently wiped away. Now, it is interesting. Now, if you were a Jew, now, can you imagine being at the foot of the cross, being there, whether you're a Roman citizen or a Jew. Now, better a Jew. Let's say you were a Jew and you were watching this uh, so-called Messiah who did all these miracles, who rose people from the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He did all these things. 
He's now hanging on a cross, nude, bloody, beaten beyond recognition, dying. And the last word that he utters is, is, is it is finished. Uh, te, te, telestai, telestai, just the last word he utters, it is finished. Now, if you were a Jew and you're watching this man dying, you're thinking, well, I guess he was a nobody. Like he may can't be the son of God. He how can he be up there? And remember, you're a Jew. And then he says those words, you would immediately know what he was talking about. And why? Because every year since Moses' time, centuries before, the high priest would take the scapegoats, remember, they would, he would take two scapegoats, he would, one of them he, he would put his hands on and they would go off into the wilderness and the other one he would grab, he would take it and slaughter it, slaughter it, taking the blood, putting the blood at the door of the Holy of Holies as he enters the door of, Holy, of the Holies, in there is the Ark of the Covenant, he puts blood on the Ark, he puts blood all over himself, there's blood everywhere, when he finishes that, when he does, when he's done doing that, he goes outside the door, the curtain, and he says, "What? It is finished." That's what the high priest would say. Can you imagine hearing Jesus say that? To Telestai, he's hanging on the cross. You're a Jew. You know that this happens every year. They do the, the atonement. The day of atonement is every year. And every year, they're all surrounded, and all the religious people, they're there, they're waiting for the high priest to come out, all bloody, everything bloody, everything that you've been, you've been uh, not eating, you, you've been fasting, you've been praying, and he goes in there, does what he's supposed to do, he steps out of the curtain, and he says to Telestai, it is finished, that's what the high priest says. Now you're looking at Jesus suffering on the cross, and he says right before he dies, it is finished, just like a high priest. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would like, if, if you're a Jew, you'd be going like, what did he say? He can't say that. He said it because he finished what he came to do. He was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world of everyone who believes in him, believes his promises. That is amazing. You would think that the last thing a dying man would do is think about that. He does something else. He fulfills prophecy. So throughout his life, he's fulfilling prophecy. And right before he said it to Telestai, or it is finished, he asks for, he says, I thirst. Right out of prophecy. And somebody goes and grabs a sponge, sour, or sour wine, vinegar, basically, and puts it on a hip up, uh, a pole and puts it up and puts it on his mouth. Fulfilling scripture, fulfilling prophecy. Now he's dying. He's been beat to death and he's fulfilling a prophecy. He has the, the mind band and the, and the mind width to be able to think of prophecy. And he does. He fulfills prophecy. And after he says that, he says, Bang, it is finished. And he dies. He gives up the spirit. That is incredible. That is incredible. To be able to do that, be fully conscious of what was going on and why he came and saying, I've done it. I've done it. I've done it for you. We've done it for you. I've done it for us. It is finished. When Jesus said it is finished, he fulfilled the mission of redemption that he came to do. This statement it is profound. It, 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 his conversation brings in Psalm 22 and Psalm 69. Jesus fulfills prophecy. He fulfills prophecy. He completes his earthly mission. He, he makes atonement for our sins, and he defeats the devil, Satan, and evil. He overcame it. 
the death of Jesus also inaugurated, it ushered in the new covenant spoken about in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. It ushered in the new covenant. The new covenant in which God's law would be written on our hearts, not on a tablet. God's law would be written on our hearts, not on our tablet. I remember years ago, when the Ten Commandments were written, and they were written, and you go to school, you say, hey, there are the Ten Commandments. Didn't read them. But, I mean, you say, oh, the Ten Commandments. So they're written on a wall. And, oh, eventually some liberal people came and said, oh, we don't want God in schools. We'll take the Ten Commandments out. But guys, here we're being told, and Scripture tells us, the New Covenant says, Hey, no longer will the, the, his commands be written on a scroll, be written on the wall. They are going to be written on your heart. Your heart. Meaning that when you commit sin and evil, or when you stumble, you know you've fallen. It's written on your heart. So he inaugurated the new covenant. And not only that, not only is the, the commandment of God written out, written on your heart, God tells us in the new covenant that he will be our God and that we will be his people. That's what Jesus ushered in. He did away with the sacrificial uh, ordinances where they would sacrifice animals and all this. He did away with that. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He did away with that. In fact, after Jesus' death, some 40 years later, the temple was destroyed, has never been built, has never been rebuilt. They have not sacrificed any of the Jews who do not believe in Jesus, who turned away from him, who helped crucify him. Their temple was destroyed. They have not been able to, to, to make another sacrifice, animal sacrifice in the temple because there is no temple. This is a reminder. The essence of what Jesus is doing is that it is finished, signifies the completion of Jesus' redemptive work. It is a victorious declaration. He makes a declaration that the purpose for which he came to earth has been accomplished, fully accomplished. Now, here's what we run into problems, even with some Christians, because there are certain denominations, and the denomination, at least one, the big one, is the Roman Catholic Church. The, the, they, have, they have added to this, this, this verse and Holy Scripture. The, the Roman Catholic Church has interpreted it differently and has confused their followers by interpreting interpreting this differently because this is the sufficiency. Christ came to die. It is sufficient to cover your sins. Or else, I mean, why would he come? If, if, Christ, if God was going to come down from heaven to cover our sins, to completely pay the price for our sins, that's one thing. That is, that's a God thing. But what if God said, okay, I'm going to come and I'm going to pay the price for your eternal sins, but... After I die, and after you receive me, if you sin again, well, you're on your own. Then wouldn't it be a waste of God's time to do that? Because we all sinned. Even when you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you did, and you realized that he took away, he cleansed you from your sins. How long did it take you to sin again? Real quick, okay, so, okay, now let me tell you what the Catholic Church teaches, and why am I telling you this? Because I want you to know, because many of you were Catholics or no Catholics, okay, and they're confused, okay? We love them. We lovingly care for them, and we pray for them, but, it, but it's difficult because they're being told a lie. They're being told a lie. Now, to be clear, there are Catholic and evangelical or Protestant doc doctrines that we agree on, okay? But here, when it comes to salvation, there was a split in the church. The reformers split. I mean, there, there is a divide. 
We base what we believe on what is written in Holy Scripture. When it comes to the total sufficiency of the work of Christ, there's some major differences uh, that the Catholic Church believes in, okay? The Catholic Church theology distinguishes sin in two ways. And you Catholics know this, just so it's just a reminder. The first, first of all, they distinguish between sin committed before baptism and sin committed after baptism, okay? The Roman Catholic Church then, the Roman Catholic Church theology distinguishes between eternal, the eternal punishment of sin and the temporal punishment of sin. Temporal being sinning, active sinning, sinning in the here and now. So you're born into sin when you're born. You're com you're born in the Adamic nature, the nature of the fallen nature into a fallen uh, environment. You're born because your parents are sinners, so you're born in sin. And so we're we're born with a sinful nature. Well, they they we, they make a distinction be between that. The eternal nature and the eternal punishment of sin and the temporal punishment of sin, the sin you commit after you're born, after you're baptized, okay? The Roman Catholic Church believes that when a believer is baptized, the eternal, and, and stay with me, okay? The eternal and corporate punishment of sin is blotted out by the grace of God, the work of Christ through the baptismal rite or ritual. Okay? They believe it. Sin that is committed after baptism is in a different category now. The temporal punishment is that which the individual, which we must work out for ourselves. When we sin after we're baptized, this is Roman Catholic theology, evangelical or, Pro or Protestant theology does not believe this because we believe in the sufficiency of, of Christ's salvation, dying on the cross. We believe it's pays for everything. Well, here in Roman Catholic theology, they believe that you have to work out your sin. You sinned in the temporal realm in the here and now, and now you have to work out for yourselves. Now, they believe that God's grace will help you, help you, and they also believe that you have to adhere to the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. So it is a works religion. So when you sin after you've been baptized, and most of us were baptized as infants, don't even remember. Well, any sin committed after that is, is a temporal sin, and you have to work that out, you yourself. Now, the grace of God will help you, but you have to also do the sacraments. It is very similar to what the Jews did, similar somewhat. You know how the Jews, when they sinned, they had to make a sacrifice. They did sacrifice, blood sacrifices. And after a while, they depended on the blood sacrifices, thinking that's what got them saved instead of the grace that God had put in there and the, and the, the forecoming, the foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice that was to come. So their focus was on just being obedient to the sacrifices, and they forgot about the grace of God. That's the Jews. Now, the Roman Catholics, they're saying that you have to work out your punishment for sin through the grace of God and through doing all the sacraments, if you miss one year, you're gone, you're gone, you're, you're going to hell. And let's say you just, in other words, you have to live a moral life. If you don't live a moral life, you sin again, you're gone, you're condemned. Unless, you know, you, unless now they bring in something else, it's not in the Bible, this is not in the Bible, but something else is not in the Bible that they bring in, it's purgatory. That's not in the Bible, they say, well, when you die, you haven't, you haven't done enough to save yourself. But now you gotta go to purgatory and you gotta spend 10,000, 100,000 years just in the fires of hell burning through there. And even as your, your relatives can pray you out of hell, okay? That's the belief, okay? That's it. Now, where is the sufficiency of the work of Christ there? 
It's nowhere. It's like Jesus came and died on the cross for nothing. That's not what our passage is saying. That's not what Holy Scripture says. So when we share Jesus with, with, with our loved ones, with other Catholics, nominal Catholics or Catholics that have been discon disconnected from the church, and they're just confused. They just don't know if I'm going, I just don't, man, I just don't know if I'm going to heaven. You know, you've had these conversations. In fact, when you go to funerals of a loved one and you ask the, you ask the priest, hey, are they going to go, are they going to go to heaven? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But let's pray a rosary. You know, a rosary. Okay, they're trying to pray them into heaven. Where is the sufficiency of the, of the work of Christ? It's nowhere to be found. That is Satan at work. Can you imagine if you go to your loved one and say, there is a, there's a guarantee that you're going to heaven? Well, what's that guarantee? Because you believe in Jesus. And there are Catholics who believe in Jesus. I was one of them. We were one of them. We received him as our Savior. And so what's the guarantee? The guarantee is that God shed, Jesus shed God blood for you to pay for your sins. And you're wiped. Your, your slate, your bookkeeping slate that God has, got Manny Alanis' name on there, it's wiped clean. Paid in full. Glory bound. You know, sometimes I don't feel glory, glory bound, but I just have to remind myself that Jesus paid for it all. He died for our sins. See, you share that with your brothers and sisters, your Catholic brothers and sisters, the guarantee that it's okay, that they are saved, the wonderfulness of Jesus Christ and what he did and laying down his life. God gave us, God gave us, God gave us his son. The one who believes in him is what? Saved. That is, that is sad. It, it is sad that there's a, uh, there, there's a denomination that calls itself Christian that can distort the word of God like that. That is, the, that is man being corrupted and, and bringing in things that are not written in Holy Scripture and not trusting the word of God. See, the, you know why you and I try to live a, a moral life? Why, why do we try to live a moral life? Meaning, why do we live a life of right and wrong? Well, we don't do it to be saved. We're already saved. We do it because we're saved. We're called to live a righteous life. And when we don't, we repent because we feel bad. When we don't, we repent because we feel bad. And, and there are people we love that may be living in sin, and maybe tr a true believer. Well, they have to turn away from that sin and turn to Christ, turn to the Lord and be healed, be restored. That's why we live this moral life. You imagine the kids at the elementary I'm at, that they're like, they're living in an area that we're thinking like, golly, they're suffering here. Can you imagine that little child trying to earn his way to heaven? Because that's what, they're, that's what the Catholic religion is telling us to do. We've got to earn our way to heaven. Can you imagine that child earning his way to heaven? It can't be done, but can you imagine you going to him and telling them about Jesus and how Jesus loves them? And although it, it may be a struggle here, we're all struggling. But we're here to help. We're here to walk with you. And your kingdom is in the kingdom of God. And your mansion, so to speak, is waiting for you in the kingdom of God. That is hope. That is a hope that will not disappoint, a hope that they want. Listen, the uh, 2024 Summer Olympic Games began just a few days ago. And there's some wicked things going on that, that you and I talked about. Um, we don't need to focus on that. They're going to have to deal with God. God takes care of himself. He will handle everybody. Everyone has to stand before God. But he's using you and me. He's using us to share Jesus with them. They need Jesus. The people that did that 
Terrible demonstration about of the Last Supper. Terrible. They need Jesus. They need him. And can they be saved? Absolutely, they can be saved. We were terrible sinners for years. And God saved me, saved us. You just can't understand why. Because he loves us. He will save you. And he can save you. So, what do you... Oh, what, what's interesting about the Olympic Games, so going back to the Olympic Games real quick, is there are a lot of Olympic athletes, if you notice, that go up there and they thank God. They're thanking God. They're thanking Jesus. Now, they got a lot of attention. They don't want to hear that. But they're thanking God. And they're not thanking God because they're, um, they want to go medal or something. And, and they do thank him for that. But they thank him because God saved them and gave an opportunity to compete at such a high level. But they realize that the highest level is salvation in the kingdom of God. And there are a lot of Olympic, Olympic athletes that are thanking Christ for that. And that, that, that kind of brings joy to the work of Christ going on, going on all over the world. So what do you need to hear when we look at a passage like this? The salvation of God's people is complete, completed in the work of Christ. The salvation of all God's people is completed, completed, completed. There is no more that can be done. It's been done by the blood, the blood of, of Christ. So what's your part? What's your part? What's your part in all this? Well, in John chapter 6, verse 29, the people ask Jesus, hey, what, what do we need to do to do the work of God, to do the work of God? And Jesus kind of stops them and basically tells them, hey, the work of God is, the work of God is standing right in front of you. The work of God that you, the work of God is that you believe in him whom he has sent. It was stand, he, that person was standing right in front of him. He's basically telling them the work of God. What can you do to do the work of God, to be saved, to get eternal life? Believe in me. That's what Jesus was telling them. That's what Jesus is telling us. Now, you who are in Christ, you believe in Jesus. But it's a constant thing. It's a good, um, sanctification is continuous. It goes on all the time. Why? Because the attacks are there. The attacks are there. Whether there are fleshly attacks, whether they're from the world and to temptations of the world, or if, if it's one of Satan's minion attacking you, they're there. And so you go always go back to the Word, go back to worshiping Him, and go back to trusting in the work of Christ. And that is wonderful. So do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Have you received Him as Lord and Savior? Amen. If you have. If you have had comfort in knowing that God will complete the work that he has began in you, and he will bring it to completion. Amen. Let us pray.